Hey guys, welcome to section 1.1 on relations and functions. Let's get started. The very first topic that we have to talk about is relations. So this is going to be somewhat of a vague definition for now. And as we progress through the course, we'll start adding more and more dimensions to it. So for now, it's really quite simple. Any set of ordered pairs is a relation. An ordered pair is kind of like the points that yeah, you can think of them as points from the xy coordinate plane. So if you have the point two comma three, there's an order to them. The first coordinate is always the x coordinate. The second coordinate is always the y coordinate. So if you have a collection of ordered pairs or some set of ordered pairs, set is the same thing as a collection, then this is known as a relation. So any collection of ordered pairs, we will call that a relation. So it's really quite simple. Now we can represent the relation as a set in this notation with these curly brackets at the end, or we can draw it as a mapping, M-A-P-P-I-N-G. A mapping just is, it conveys the same information as this, but in a, a, a kind of a graphical form or graphical notation. So this means that if two is the input or two is getting mapped to three, four is getting mapped to five, six is getting mapped to seven, eight is getting mapped to nine, which is the same exact information we had up here. Now, yet another way uh, to represent relations is maybe in the shape of a graph. So you've seen these things before, maybe you just didn't have the labels for them, but all these things are uh, examples of relations. Now, how is it that a relation becomes a function? Well, if it satisfies one additional condition. So in addition to just being a set of ordered pairs, for a function, for each input, there is only one unique output. So if we were to take a look at this closer, two is getting mapped to three, four is getting mapped to five, six is getting mapped to seven, eight is getting mapped to nine. So for each one of these input elements, there is only a single unique output element. So two goes to three, four goes to five, six goes to seven, eight goes to nine. So for each input element, there is only a single unique output element. So in this particular case, uh, if we were to take a look at this graph, no matter which x coordinate you pick. So let's say we pick this x coordinate right here. Now this x coordinate is going to yield this as the y coordinate. So whatever the y coordinate is of this point is, that's going to be what that x coordinate gets mapped to. That's why that point is the point that's on this function or on this graph. Now, no matter which x coordinate you pick, you will never be able to find two different output values or maybe three output values. That's what makes a relation a function. So whenever you have an input, if there's only one unique output, then the relation is a function. So a function is a special type of relation. Something more has to happen to a relation in order for it to become a function. So, well, then naturally, hopefully, you're asking the question, well, then which relations are not functions? So let's take a look at something like this. Two getting mapped to three, two getting mapped to four, two getting mapped to five, three getting mapped to seven. And if we were to take a look at this, you'll notice that two, this input, does not have one unique output. In fact, it has three outputs. Two has an output of three, two has an output of four, two has an output of five. So this is a relation because it's a set of ordered pairs, but it's not a function because there is not a unique output for each input. And if we were to take a look at this same thing in a graphical notation, well, two is getting mapped to three, it's getting mapped to four, it's getting mapped to five. So this breaks the whole idea behind a function. And if we were to take a look at this graph, well, let's say we choose this x coordinate. Well, for this one single x coordinate, this is one y coordinate. And if we keep going up, this is another y coordinate, whatever this number happens to be. And if we go down from here, this is one y coordinate, and this is yet another y coordinate. 
So if I were to say, hey, if I give you this x coordinate, let's say, imagine it to be five, when x is equal to five, what's the output? Well, then you can say, well, it's one, it's seven, it's negative one, and maybe negative five. So there's not one unique output for that particular input. Now, let's look, take a look at zero. If x is zero, well, y could either be, I don't know, 1.5, it could also be 6.5, it's also negative 0 0.75, and also negative 5, let's say, arbitrarily. So again, the idea between this curve versus this curve, no matter which x value you choose, you will only ever find a single unique y value as the output. In this graph, that's not the case. So if you were to choose this x value, unfortunately there's one, two y values that come out of that single x value. Now, How is it that we can do this in perhaps a slightly easier manner? Well, we have this nice handy dandy thing called the vertical line test. So the vertical line test says the following, and this is something that you should commit to memory, make sure you know what the test specifically says, so you can use it correctly. If we can use a vertical line and draw it anywhere on the graph, so imagine taking a pencil or some, some straight object, and you just drop it on the graph, or on your page, where the picture is, if that pencil or that straight object crosses more than once, then the graph that you're given is that of a relation, but it's not that of a function. So let's take a look at something that looks like this. So if you have an S-shaped curve, if you were to make a vertical line right here, you would cross the function once, twice, three times. That's more than once. So automatically, this is not a function. I just drew more vertical lines so you can see, well, you should be able to draw the lines anywhere. So whether you draw it here or here or here or here, doesn't really matter. If it fails once, it's not a function. Whereas for a picture that looks something like this, for this graph, it, it, this is a relation and this is a relation. But this relation is not a function because it fails the vertical line test. Now this relation, on the other hand, if we were to draw a vertical line here, 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 or here, and no matter where you draw the vertical line, you'll notice that you can only ever cross the function once. So either here, right here, right here, right here, and no matter where you make these vertical lines, you can only ever cross the line once. That's why this is not just a relation, but also a function. That is not true of this graph. So this graph is a relation, but it is not a function because it fails the vertical line test. Next uh, couple of ideas that we have to remember are that of domain and range. So the domain is defined to be the set of all the numbers or all input values. They don't have to be numbers. It's the set of or collection of all input values that you can plug into a function and the function gives you a valid output. So those are things that you plug into the function. So imagine the x values that you plug in. And we'll see a couple of examples of this in the future. This is always the independent variable because you can choose whatever you want. It does not depend on anything else. So the domain is always the independent variable. The range, by contrast, is the set or the collection of all output values. And this is something you have to remember, the distinction between these two. The domain is the collection of all input values. The range is the collection of all output values that the function gives you when you pick something from the domain and plug it into the function. So domain gets plugged into a function. The function does some number crunching to it and then gives you back a range or a range element. This is a dependent variable, and the reason why that's the case is because the output depends on the input. The input does not depend on anything. The input could be anything it wants to be as long as it is within the domain. However, the output always depends on the input, so that's why we call that the dependent variable. So let's see a couple of examples of this. So let's say we're given this picture, we're given this mapping, and the question states, find the domain and range of this given question. So looking at the arrowheads, this is the tail of the arrow, this is the head of the arrow. So two 
when you give the function a two, it the function takes it and gives you back a six. When you give the function a one, the function takes it, does some number crunching to it, and gives you back a five. When you give the function a three, it does some stuff to it and gives you a nine. Now again, I don't need to know what the function is. I don't know what the computation's happening, the two, one, and three. I just know that these are the input values. These are the output values that the function is giving me. So this becomes my domain, and this becomes the range. And the way we can write that is we, because the domain is a set, we can just again put it in curly brackets and say one comma two comma three. We're just listing the elements of that set, the stuff that's inside of it. The range, on the other hand, is the set of all the output values. So if you know, put them together into a set, that's it. Let's take a look at another one. So instead of it being given to us in a graphical form like it was here, let's say we just give you a set of ordered pairs. Well, remember, ordered pairs means the input or the x coordinate comes first, the output and the y or the y coordinate comes second. So the domain of this set would simply be the collection of all the inputs. So two, seven, and negative three. And we can put them together inside of a set. That becomes our domain. The output or the range elements are the y coordinates of five, one, and four thirds. Five, one, four thirds. That's it. The last thing we talk about is function notation and evaluation of functions at given x points or given input values. So functions for the rest of your mathematical careers will more or less be notated as this. And the way you read this is f of x. This is never, ever, 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 ever multiplication of f and x. So this does not mean f times x, even though there are parentheses here. And typically we use this notation whenever we want to indicate multiplication. But function notation requires that this be read and this be used as f of x. What this means is f is a function of x. Never, ever, ever, please don't make this mistake. Please be very, very careful with this and make sure you put a big star next to it and, and internalize this. So notationally, if we say f of x equals 2x plus 3, that means f is a function of x. So f is the dependent variable, that's the output, and x is the independent variable, that's the input. So the way you read this is, x is the input, so x can assume any value you want it to. It could be a number, it could be a variable, it could be an expression, it could be another function. You can plug functions inside of other functions. So there's no restriction on that here. x could be whatever input it wants to be based on that input or depending on that input, we're going to get an output value for f. So f is known as the dependent variable in this problem, and x is the independent variable. Now if we had changed this to g and l, we would read this as g of l, where g would be a function of l, g would be the dependent variable, that would be the output, and L would be the independent variable, that would be the input. So let's see how we can actually use this stuff. So let's say we have an easy example here, f of x, this function is 2x plus 3. Now if I were to say, well, tell me what f of 3 is. Now what that means is, wherever you see the input variable, the independent variable, replace that with 3. And if we do that, the two comes down as it is, nothing changes there. This x gets replaced with this three. That's what we're evaluating this function at. And then the plus three just comes down as it is. And order of operations, hopefully you remember, we have to multiply before we add. So two times three gives us six. Six plus three is nine. So f of three equals nine means if you give this function an input of three, the output will be nine. And I, I forgot to mention this here, and I, maybe I should have written this, but maybe you guys can write it in as your notes. One way of representing this as an ordered pair would be parentheses open, three comma nine parentheses closed. That's the way you would denote this with the notation that we had used previously in this talk. 
Also, if we were to say, well, what's f of p? You do the same exact thing. Instead of the input variable x, we're just replacing it with p. So 2 times p plus 3 is simply 2p plus 3. So all we did was, again, we replaced x with p. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there's no restriction on what we cannot plug in here. So f of negative m would simply mean that wherever you see an x, replace it with negative m. So 2 times negative m plus 3 implies that this is equal to negative 2 times m plus 3. And again, we only replace the x with a negative m. And finally, I just wanted to give you another example here, a little more variety. f of 3l gets solved the same exact way. Instead of the x here, you replace the x with 3l. So 2 times 3l plus 3 gives us 6l plus 3. And that's it. That's our answer. So in this course, we're going to talk about linear functions and expressions. We're mostly going to concentrate, in fact, on expressions and equations. We won't talk so much about linear functions and polynomial functions and rational functions and radical functions. They will all be there, and that's how we've uh, designed this course. We're mostly going to deal with expressions and how we simplify them. And then when you head off into college algebra, that's where you know, you'll start seeing not only just expressions, but how is it that expressions are used uh, or the techniques that you learn in this course in terms of how to simplify them or simplifying expressions. How is that used to solve problems with linear functions and polynomial functions and rational functions and radical functions and other types of functions that we'll see in college algebra? So in this course, it, it's more about the techniques and the tools that are needed. In future courses, you actually start using those tools to build uh, you know, a much richer understanding of mathematics. So again, welcome to the course. Hopefully it's a great semester. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out.